Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and rest assured, ladies and gentlemen, I shan't break into song during this uh, presentation. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the Trust and the Young Nuffield Bob Matson Award for kindly sponsoring my study, to the Royal Welsh Agricultural Society for giving me that valuable time away from the organisation, and to my family, friends, sponsors, and in particular, uh, my wife Lisa, for her love, support, patience, and understanding. We got married last December, and she was adamant that the honeymoon should not include a Nuffield component, but I'm afraid, uh, ladies and gentlemen, she failed. <laughs> Nevertheless, the last two years has been a hugely rewarding experience in my pursuit to answer the question, where do agricultural societies and shows go from here? And this aerial behind me, this aerial photograph, shows a spitfire flying over the Royal Welsh showground. And we're very proud of the beautiful landscape that provides the backdrop to our show. But much has changed in the farming landscape since agricultural societies were first established back in the mid-18th century. Back then, their entire focus was to improve agricultural productivity, and shows soon emerged as the principal vehicle to deliver that aim, where livestock competitions were aimed to identify superior genes in animals, and where the latest technology and farm implements would have been showcased to farmers and landowners. Today, however, their role is far more diverse, and on average, uh, in the UK, we have about 7 million visitors to shows each year. But how do we translate that rich history, heritage, and tradition to modern farming and the modern visitor? Well, in order to answer that question, I organized an intense program of international travel, which took me to a total of 11 countries across four continents, clocking up a total of 49,292 air miles, the equivalent of twice around the globe, uh, where I conducted some 94 uh, meetings and interviews and visited some 27 showgrounds in total. So after all of that, what did I learn? Well, firstly, it's important to recognize that the visitor profile at our events is changing, and we're not just talking to farmers. This slide shows research conducted at the Royal Wales Show back in 2015, where it established that almost 60% of our visitors did not work in agriculture. The audience of the Royal Wales Show, as indeed many others, extends far beyond the farming sector itself. With a trend of falling direct employment in agriculture, our visitor profile is becoming increasingly detached from the land. In the same survey, we asked the question, what is the single thing you've liked most about the show? And this word cloud shows 50 of the most common responses. And the larger the typeface, the greater the number of time that word was given as the answer. It goes to reinforce that the most popular attractions are livestock and animals, food and variety, and socializing and atmosphere. And these results, they're not unique to the UK. Similar surveys conducted in Australia, America, and Canada consistently highlight that people come for the livestock, the food, and above all, a good day out. So there's been this, this shift in focus, whereby the charitable aims of societies of furthering agricultural progress has shifted from that towards what has been described as shows acting as PR agencies for farming, underpinned, of course, by that strong social purpose. But what is reassuring is that livestock still features heavily as the key reasons for people going and attending shows. Which leads me on to one of the more challenging questions I ask in my Nuffield. Is the showing of animals still relevant to the modern, progressive, commercial farmer? Well, competitive exhibitions of livestock began as a means to promote breed improvement. Animals would be judged against the breed standard, which had been driven by the trends and fashions of the time. And during my research, I, uh, I stumbled across a wonderful description of a prize-winning loin on a three-year-old weather which won at a show back in 1799, on which, and I quote, the fat measured seven inches. <laughs> Clearly, big was beautiful back then, and much has changed. Much, much has changed. If you compare um, the picture of the, the Trojan, the Hereford Bull, painted in 1826 with the Supreme Beef Champion on the right of the Royal Welsh Show, you can see how modern breeding has changed the breed. Rolls of wobbling fat has been replaced by this beautifully proportioned bull. But showing has become a profession almost in itself. And I spent a fair bit of time in the States, and this is the type of show animal that would excel in the US of A. And described as some of the most pampered cows in America, these animals when pictures of these animals went viral on social media some years ago under the hashtag fluffy cows. 
And clearly, and I think it is true, there is sometimes a disconnect between, between the animals which excel in the show ring and those who commercially make money for the farmer. Performance measures such as EBVs, and we've heard this morning about genetics, plays an increasing role in the way we farm, and ignoring that is a risk to shows. So livestock showing still plays an overall very, very important part in our industry, but we need to embrace modern technology alongside the traditional linear assessment in order to remain relevant. But I mentioned earlier that the visitor profile is changing, which has led to shows playing an increasingly education role in their delivery. And last August, I spent a month traveling the state fairs of the Midwest. I visited Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana, Missouri, Kentucky, Iowa, uh, and Minnesota, and all of which, without exception, were committed to providing education. Most of them had education centers, animal birthing centers, hugely popular places, and I remember in Minnesota, you could sign up for a text update. So when Molly the cow was showing signs of labor, you could rush back and witness the miracle of birth. At the Indiana State Farmer, they had a virtual video wall where each day children could take part in a FaceTime with a farmer session. So there'd be a farmer stood in his or her field somewhere in Indiana taking questions from children about their day-to-day -day work. But perhaps the best example of education delivery by your agricultural show societies far closer to home, that is the Royal Highland Educational Trust. Each year, they take about 16,500 school children onto farm, deliver classroom talks to 28,000 pupils, and host about 300 school trips at their show. So as the Royal Highland Show has proven, they are more than just a show. The question I continually get asked time and time again is, what on earth, Alibach, keeps you busy for the rest of the year? Thinking, I only work for the four main days of our show. And I know it's only meant pulling pull, pull my leg, but, but there's an underlying message of lack of communication. Agriculture societies are busy. Charitable organizations, often member-led, run a number of smaller events, made make awards, bursaries, and even sponsor Nuffield scholarships. But this, that message clearly isn't getting across. But, and there are even some societies that do not have a show, most notably the Royal Agricultural Society of England, who have now developed a new farm extension service under the banner of innovation for agriculture. But the other major category of work which keeps myself and other societies busy for the remainder of the year is trading. It is a true fact that most shows are a net cost on budgets. And as Colin MacDonald, the Chief Executive of the Royal Ulster, told me in my interview, whilst you should never lose sight of your charitable aims, you cannot sustain the delivery of those aims without generating funds. Consequently, you've seen showgrounds diversify. They're no longer designed with the sole purpose of running a show. They are multi-event centers. And you'll see increasingly attempts to diversify the income streams. And here are a few examples I came across. The Indiana Farmers Coliseum, home to everything, from livestock showing to boxing fights to ice hockey teams to music concerts. This is Fodder, the farm shop located on the Great Yorkshire Showground. An excellent example of combining a charitable remit with a commercial venture. The Sydney Olympic Park, home to the Sydney Royal Easter Show with this magnificent array of sporting venues for everything from Aussie rules football to cricket. And finally, the Icon Centre, a brand new exhibition hall built at Barnmall Park in Northern Ireland. So clearly the business of societies is becoming far more diverse. And what's likely to change the way we conduct that business going forward is technology. We are living in a digital age and the most influential consumer groups in future will be the millennials, those babies born between 1980 and 2000. Described as digital natives, their behavioral patterns will be far different to previous generations. They will embrace social media and online sales, which will influence the way we communicate and market our events. It can really push the boundaries of what's possible. Utilizing technology like Wi-Fi supported analytics give you some really valuable data on your event. The number of visitors per hour to a section, average dwell times, visitor return rates, creative flow maps, and the list goes on and on. But you can have, ladies and gentlemen, the best technology, the best financial resources, the best showground. Without proper governance and good people, you simply won't get anywhere. And I'm sure many of you in this room can relate to this cartoon. which perfectly illustrates the frustrations of a committee process. At the beginning of my Nuffield, I did not set out to do any research into governance. But in the course of my interviews, it became as a reoccurring theme as such an important area to consider. And among the key learnings I feel that every show society should consider is number one, what is the optimum size of your board? 
If it's too big, it becomes too ineffective. If it's too small, it's a burden on those involved. Number two, what are the skill sets required amongst your board members, trustees? If you have a strategic agenda to grow your business, grow out of show income, diversify income, have you got the skills amongst your trustees to realize that ambition? And thirdly, thirdly, should there be term limits? I'm a firm believer in turnover and giving way to youthful ideas. I was told by, by one chief executive in my interview, historically, his trustees used to walk in vertical and go out horizontal. <laughs> Clearly, clearly that has to change. But the principles of good governance are applicable to any organization, which has been one of the other key realizations of Mind Field, is that the core skills and experiences I've developed in communication, leadership, finance, and governance are all essentially transferable. Which leads me, ladies and gentlemen, to my key take-home messages. Firstly, the show is an important social occasion for the agricultural community whilst promoting food and farming and educating the wider public. The key word there being education. The society, and please remember this, is more than just a show and must have clarity of purpose. Your core objectives, remember them, they're still relevant today, but the way in which they're delivered is changing through that effective governance and clear strategic direction. The future will rely societies to invest in your most important resource, that is people, your assets and technology, to have that core financial stability to deliver without forgetting to communicate your charitable work. Not only can we tell people, we've got to tell them what we do, do not forget to tell them the reason why we're doing it. Agricultural societies and shows have a bright future ahead, and I thank you for listening. Diochamarian.